Thanks, everybody. <clears throat> I'm Doug Sillers. Um, as Anton said, I was at PyCon UK in Cardiff, Wales, so I just got here from the airport. Um, I wasn't expecting a 90-minute line at the passport. <laughs> Sometimes. Hmm? <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about delivering video to the web because video is growing rapidly and we want to talk about the way to do it fast. Um, a little bit about me. I'm originally from Seattle, Washington, but I've been traveling with my family through Europe for about the last year and two years out of the last three. So we're kind of digital nomads right now. I do developer relations. I talk to people. I help companies with performance audits, making their web pages, their native apps faster. I run workshops. I'm the only Doug Sillers on the internet, so I'm really easy to find. <laughs> um, and I'll post up the slides on my slide share, which is Doug Sillers. Um, video is growing. I think we all know this, right? They talk about how in the evenings, Netflix is like 50% of the internet traffic, right? <laughs> People are using and consuming video like crazy. We can see the go you know, estimates that by 2021 it's going to be x-fold higher, right? It's just growing and growing and growing and people are be using video like crazy. And so I wanted to go look and see what's happening today with video on the internet, <clears throat> what people are doing right, what people are doing wrong, and then I can share that information so we can figure out what, what are the right things to do. And to do that, I was using WebPageTest. Everybody know WebPageTest? Hands? Anyone? All right. So WebPageTest is an awesome tool to test websites. Where you can test them anywhere around the world. You can select from the map. Um, I tend to use the ones in Virginia because they have mobile devices, and I'm always really interested to see how things are running on mobile. My background, I worked for 10 years at AT&T, so I always like to see how things are running on mobile. Because and because really, as we all know, the, everyone's doing everything on mobile now, too. So it's all about video on mobile and how we can optimize that. Um, so to do my study of the web, I wanted to do web page test. And the cool thing is, the HTTP archive is a open source tool. And when I did this analysis, it was scanning half a million websites every two weeks on a mobile device and on a desktop, emulated mobile device and a desktop. Uh, today, it's doing 1.2 million sites every two weeks. So we're getting this wealth of data. It's web page test data over all of these websites that we can go back and look at and see what people are doing when it comes to the web. Um, and it's all in BigQuery, so if you're interested, you can go get that data, run some SQL queries, and find out what's on the web today. So if we look over time, we can see that video is growing. These are websites that had uh, video downloads while the page was loading. And so I'm actually just looking literally for MIME type of video, right? So this actually doesn't include any websites that have YouTube embedded, because YouTube doesn't download video when you have a page with YouTube on it. Um, and as you can see, it's growing by you know half a percent a year, both on mobile and on desktop. But when we talk about what makes a good video on the internet, there's three metrics that people really worry about. The first one is, did the video start playing? You know, That's kind of important. Um, did it stall while it was playing? And did it look good while it was playing? These are what the top you know, analytics companies are looking for when they're studying how video runs on the internet. And, you know, my conclusion is if we can optimize the delivery of the video, if we can make the video smaller, they'll get delivered faster, it'll start out faster, the videos won't stall, hopefully it'll still look great. When we talk about performance, there's lots of studies out there talking about how when there's a three second delay, you lose half of your viewers on a mobile site. And there's research out there that shows that when a video is slow, when it starts up slowly, people get frustrated and angry. There's another study out there that shows that 4% of people admit to throwing their phones when a website is slow, hence the picture here. I don't have the, you know, the, that it happens for video too, but it's also just a cool photo. Um, but this is data from the first quarter of this year, and it's from Conviva. Conviva is an analytics company that monitors how video playback works. And what they found was the red bite of the pie is 400 million videos, 2% of all video plays just fail to start. 
So you press play, nothing happens, right? That's a fail, right? 400 million videos just failed to start. Two billion, that the yellow, 11.5%, you press play, it would have worked, but you gave up because it took so damn long for it to start playing, right? That's bad too, right? Everything was there for it to work, but it took so long that people just gave up. And their estimate is if, you know, that 14 or 15% of video had actually been played back, that's 800 million hours of people watching video, which you start thinking about, like, that's a lot of time that was lost because video didn't work. So I wanted to investigate what are causing these things. Um, in the HTTP archive, like, why would it fail to start, like, maybe a 404 or something like that? But that's only, like, 0.2%. Um, it's probably a lot of stuff like this, right? When I look at Amazon, and you know, I'm from the U.S., and so my Amazon video count is tied to the U.S., if I fire up that app, it says, here are all these great movies. You can't watch them because you're in Germany or you're in Wales. And that's better than seeing it, clicking it, having it load um, 231 requests, 3.1 megabytes, 18 seconds to say, Oops, right? That's just wasting everybody's time, everybody's data, all of those things. It's just better to give an announcement beforehand, like, these are the stuff you can't watch, here's the stuff you can watch. Um, so, you know, that's my idea of what's happening there. I don't, I don't know if that's all accurate, but those are my guesses. Um, but what I can look at is this 11% of videos that just, they press play, it would have worked, but everybody gave up. The same study shows that in Europe, the average video start time is 4.3 seconds. Now, averages are kind of horrible numbers because this is people out in, I just spent a month in West Cork, Ireland, in the middle of nowhere, and my Airbnb said it had Wi-Fi, but they didn't say that the Wi-Fi was connected to a 2G router, <laughs> right? So I spent an entire month on 2G, right? So that's counting people who are on 2G versus people who are here on LTE, right? It's counting everybody, mobile devices, fiber, desktop, all wrapped up into 4.3 seconds. You can't, you know, there's, there's data all over the place there. Um, <clears throat> same with North America, right? Five seconds to start up. But we also know that when things take longer, people abandon. So what does that mean? This is an older study, but Akamai found that everyone will wait two seconds. Everyone will wait, you'll press play, you'll wait two seconds. But every second after that, you lose about 6% of your customers every subsequent second. So, you know, it's probably just coincidence that four seconds, you know, two additional seconds is 12%. And that's, a you know, that's, I'm, I'm not sure that that all works out that way. But um, we do see that everybody abandoned, you, you lose people the longer it takes for a video to start up. Now, there are different types of videos that we all watch on the internet, right? And you're more likely to give up on a short video versus a long video. And sometimes the reason is because that short video is a cat dressed up like a shark on a Roomba chasing a duck. And after about three seconds, you're like, what the hell did I click on? And you move away, right? Because why? Um, but if you're watching a TV show or a movie, 20 minutes, two hours, you're more likely to hang out, right? If it takes 10 seconds for the movie to start up, you're more likely to wait because you're already planning to take that long to watch the movie. And that's shown in those graphs. Um, so I started looking with HTTP Archive, how many sites actually have video files that download? And it's 36,000 on mobile, 55,000 on desktop. Um, but I was really interested how many overlap and, you know, most of the sites that have video on mobile also have it on desktop. There are a few that didn't, which was interesting to me. But, you know, 80% of the sites on mobile also have a desktop video. And I started looking at those, and, you know, there's 207,000 video requests on desktop, 185,000 on mobile. Um, but 21,000 of those sites are using the exact same video on the desktop that they're serving to a mobile device. And you start thinking like five years ago with responsive images, we stopped serving one megabyte images to mobile devices because that's a horrible experience. It takes forever for them to download. But we're doing the exact same thing with video today. 
right? We're serving videos that are optimized for the desktop to people on mobile phones. Um, 41,000 of the videos were identical. 19%, 20% of all the videos on mobile are exactly the same as the one on desktop. So there's a huge room for improvement here. Either um, the videos, if they're identical, either it's going to take a lot longer for them to start or they don't look good, right? I mean, we're trying to balance these things. And if, it, if it's the same video on mobile that is on desktop, it's probably going to take a lot longer to start up on, uh, on a mobile device just because the network isn't as fast in general. Um, or if it's scaled down to look really good on mobile, it's just not going to look good on desktop. So we have to balance these things out and figure out what we can do. And if we go back to that image analogy, this is my goat, Josephine. Um, you know, we can optimize an image. And if this is all pretty, you know, this is all science we all kind of know. Um, you can change the quality. You can change the format. You can do a responsive image, resize it for the size of the screen. But we can walk through that, right? So the original image is two and a half megabytes. If I save it at 85%, which is what Google and Lighthouse recommend, or you could go even slow, lower, structural similarity is the idea that you remove all the pixels until the human eye can't tell a difference. So you get it down half size, 1.28 megabytes. Save it as a WebP, shave off another 40K, and then resize it 1,400 pixels wide so that it looks good on a mobile device. That's probably still really large. But, you know, I've got it 10% the size that it was. Um, and if we look at the HTTP archive for images, this is percentile of how many megabytes there are. And you can see the y-axis is, you know, the 95th percentile is there's six megabytes of image on these pages. But what we can see is, in general, mobile is lower than desktop, which is a good thing, right? We should be serving less to desktop than to, or less to mobile than to desktop. I think it should be bigger than that, but you know, that's where we are. If we look at the same thing for video, the first thing to look at is the y-axis. It's 10 times bigger, right? Now we're talking the, 95th, the 90th percentile is, you know, 50 megabytes of video is being served to mobile devices. And what's also interesting is we're actually sending more video to mobile than we are to desktop which is probably not the right way to be going. Um, so just as an overview, there's obviously a lot of stuff we can be doing here. And this is just showing that the ratio for, for images always stays below one, but for video it goes almost to 1.2 out of the 95th percentile. So what's different about video versus images? Well, the first thing is, of course, we have a third dimension, which is time, right? We have x, you know, height and width, or, and then we also have time. And then we also have an audio channel for most videos, right? Adding to the amount of data being downloaded. But video is great because it has compression through time. And what that is, the way compression is done in video is everything's broken into a group of pictures. And so the eyes on the outside are full-size images, just like you could, you know, just like a regular JPEG or whatever. And then the B frames are 25%, and they're optimized based on prediction, forward and backward predictions. The P frames are 50%, and they're forward predicted. But by doing this, you can compress through the time continuum, and you save a lot of data. And we can actually see that. So this is another one of my goats. And you can see the vectors that the p-frames are doing. And so that's like every seventh or eighth frame is a p-frame. And you can see that. We can also see the b-frame compression. And you can combine that all up. And this is all the compression that's happening through that third dimension of time, which is really, really cool. Animated GIFs, on the other hand, <laughs> don't compress through time. So if I take a movie, you've seen the movie of uh, this is Nora the goat. The, the movie is 1.4 megabytes. Um, when I make it into an animated GIF, I get my 256 colors because animated GIFs are from the 80s. Um, everything was 256 colors in the 80s. I tell my kids that. They don't believe me. Um, but that animated GIF is 3.8 megabytes. 
And the reason for that is it, GIFs don't do any compression through that third axis of time. It's literally a flip book of GIF images. Um, but what you can do with a GIF, obviously, is I've turned this into a movie, 256 colors, strip out the audio channel, because it's a silent, it's going to just play around, this is a movie. And I can put it in a video tag, right? Loop, autoplay, muted, plays in line, and now on a mobile device, this will loop and it'll look exactly like an animated GIF. It has, autoplay isn't enough on mobile Chrome and mobile Safari. You have to say muted so that it'll loop. And the reason for that is we all browse the web when we're in meetings. And if the video plays out loud, we're all outed. <laughs> right? And so that's why it's muted. I'm sure it's just to keep us in class and in, you know, when we're not supposed to be on the web, nobody knows. Um, so the, the folks at Chrome and Safari have our back in that case. Um, but video isn't preloaded. It's always the last thing to download because as I've shown, video files are ginormous. So if your, your animated GIF that's really an MP4 it needs to be one of the first things to show, this might be a problem. However, in Safari, today, you can actually put an MP4 in the picture tag and make it loop and do all of those things. So if you load this up in a browser in Safari, if I put all the loop autoplay muted and all those things, we get a looping animated GIF and it's 250 kilobytes. The animated WebP is three megabytes, so that's your Chrome, and then everybody else is the 3.8 megabytes of the animated GIF. So if you were to do this today, your iOS and your Safari users would get a much faster experience because it's downloading a file that's 10 times smaller. If we look at the different file extensions that are used on the web today, most of the MP4s, TS is um, our streaming files, so we'll talk about that a little bit too, but I want to talk a little bit about what we, MP4s are the predominant video file being downloaded today, so let's talk about what we can do to optimize that. Um, this is American Baseball, this is the Red Sox, and this is the desktop page, and that video there is the same video that's here on the mobile page, it's the exact same video. It's 17 megabytes, and on mobile, it took 58 seconds for it to download. And the reason for that is that it's 17 megabytes, it's 960 by 540, and it's like 83 seconds long. And it's, it's a replay of a two hour long baseball game, or a two and a half hour baseball game. So it's a great summary, it actually looks really good. Once it loads, it's fine. It's just the fact that it takes a while for it to load on a 3G connection. But what can we do to optimize that? Let's see what's happening here. All right, what if I downscale it to 1.3 megabits per second? Um, and I just did that. I was using Cloudinary, which is a cloud-based tool. Um, and I could just change it to auto uh, quality the video. And that makes it uh, quality 70. So it's just reducing the quality of the video. It reduces the audio from 44 kilobits per second to 22. No one will notice a difference. It's people talking about baseball, right? And crack, right? The ball hitting a bat. No one's going to notice. Um, you know, I, I cut it down 22%. No one's going to notice a difference. I can then also create maybe a mobile version, which is 6.4 megabytes. And now I have two files that's only slightly bigger than that one original file. So if you're worried about hosting or anything like that, this is actually going to, you know, you're going to transmit less data through your network, so you're going to spend less money on your back end, and your storage cost isn't going to be dramatically different, but you have two videos that you can serve to um, your customers, one that's mobile optimized and one that's more of a desktop optimized. It's more uh, expensive anyway. Hmm? Traffic is more expensive anyway. Because? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the money that they have to up for the hosting. Right. Uh, just nothing compared to, to the traffic. The traffic. Exactly, right. Because 17 down to 13, yeah. you've just made it 22% less traffic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then if, you, if half of your people are on mobile, you made it 60% smaller. So you're saving. But if you, when you start thinking that there's 34 baseball teams times whatever, sometimes there's a concern like the hosting would be so much, but it's, a, it's like 5% more hosting. So it's not really going to break the yeah. bank there. Um, 
Another thing that I've seen is this was the desktop site. It downloaded 250 kilobytes of video. And then on the same exact mobile site, it doubled the amount of video that it downloaded. And the reason for this is when you run, when I was running these tests on the HTTP archive, I was using a Moto G4, which happens to be a Retina device. And so it's actually downloading the Retina videos. You can see the 2x.webm, so it's downloading you know, twice the size of the videos are twice as big. They're these little looping videos to see what's going, you know. They're showing something off on their website. And so you can see that, you know, if it can do retina, it's doing the retina videos. That's great if you think you need that on a mobile device. Um, however, <clears throat> they only show the video if the width is over 1,024 pixels. So it downloads these videos retina style and then hides them with the CSS. So if you're gonna download the video, how about you make sure that it shows up on the screen, right? We went through this again with, with images for a long time where we were downloading the large images, but we don't wanna show it on our mobile sites, we'll just hide it. But everyone's still paying for the download. Um, these are all still live on the internet today too, so you can. <laughs> um, Preload equals auto. So if you have a video file, one of the, the parameters, attributes you can put in is the preload. You can say preload equals auto. Have you ever gone to a website on your mobile phone and you see there's a video on the page, you're like, I don't really care that much and I'm on cellular so I'm not gonna press play because I don't wanna download it. This website decided for you. <laughs> it downloaded the entire video and it turns out that it was 23 and a half megabytes of video that it downloaded whether or not you press play or not. So preload equals auto is awesome if it, you're like, you know that someone's gonna watch that video. If you've got like an 85% pretty sure that they're gonna watch the video, use preload equals auto, but just don't use it because I want it there so when they press play, it's ready to play right away because again, you know, your, your traffic costs are just gonna go out like crazy if every single time someone loads your homepage, you're sending 23 megabytes of video through the network. Now, um, you might think, well, there's preload equals metadata. That'll work. And so what that does is it downloads like two or 3% of the video as opposed to the whole video. Gets an idea of you know, the dimensions and the length so it can lay it out on the screen properly. Um, however, in this case, it was, it's, so you can see it's one request, right? I just want a little bit of the video one video request, um, but it ends up being 2.7 megabytes of video that are downloaded on a mobile device. It's the first 3% of this movie because the movie is 1080p, two and a half minutes long and 97 megabytes. And they're sending it to mobile desktop and mobile devices, right? Now, of course, this is a video that people are gonna see on the mobile site. Let's show you where it is on the website. So if you start here, this is about the first five viewports, but it's not there. It's not in the first 10 viewports. It's there. <laughs> so what are the odds on a mobile device that you're going to scroll through all of this to get to that video and then play it? Zero. Zero. So you just downloaded 2.7 megabytes which is fine, right, if you think people are gonna watch it, but in this case, the odds of somebody watching this is zero, essentially. So your mileage may vary with preload equals metadata, but use discretion, right? I mean, this is just gonna be lots of data traffic and no one's ever gonna see that video. Uh, preload equals metadata is, if you don't use preload in Chrome, metadata is the default term. So it will, if you have no preload, it'll do metadata automatically. Um, so the best practices, avoid auto unless you think someone's really going to watch it. And metadata, there's a media, if there's a medium probability of play, go for it, but your mileage might vary on that one. So just test and see what you think is going to happen. Um, I don't really like background images, like when I'm viewing the web, but I've talked to a lot of developers and, and there's research out there that shows when there's background video, customers are more engaged, like 80% more engagement. So there's a reason why there's so many people adding background videos to websites because people really like it. Um, 
So here's a website. It's a kids play area thing that's at the malls around. I think are they all over Europe or are they just in the UK? I found this through web page test. But anyway, this is the video. And I don't have the sound on my computer, but what's interesting about this is they it's a background video, but they didn't strip out the audio channel. So it's playing this video and you know, it's this guy talking about this is a great place to take your kids and you should spend thousands of euros when you go there with your kids. Um, and we can look at it and we can see that there's two streams. So FF Probe is a cool tool. It will look at all the videos. The only reason I looked at this video is a lot of times, you know, the video at the top of the page is called a hero video or something. This one is called Steven. And so I was like, I got to see what Steven's all about. And it comes, they edit it in such a way that it starts in the middle of a sentence. And I'm like, well, that's really weird. What the hell is going on now? And then I look further and further and further. And we can actually look at the different formats. We see that there's two streams. We can look at the two streams, right? So this is telling us the codec. It's giving us, you know, the width and the height and all sorts of stuff about the, the video part. But we also see there's an audio stream at 44 kilobits per second. And it ends up being 5% of the video it is an audio stream that no one will ever. So it's like if a tree falls in the forest and no one hears it, like we're downloading this audio, but the web page never makes a sound. Um, if the video is going to be silent, strip out the audio. It's an easy save, easy win, very easy to do. Um, and if you're going to show it on mobile, if you're going to download it on mobile, make sure it plays on mobile. Again, the same idea, right? They're high, they download the whole video, but then they have a placeholder image there. They don't show it. Um, video is green web page test. You can see it down there at the very bottom of the video being downloaded. Um, so if the viewport isn't going to support the video, just don't download it. Um, this one is really interesting because it's for adults incontinence underwear in America. I don't know if this depends. Is that here in Germany too? It's for people who have, you know, issues with, with their bladder, right? And so there is a video in the background. And I learned that Bob Ross doesn't just paint. <laughs> <laughs> He's also a photographer. Um, this video is 33 megabytes. It's 27 seconds long, and it's 2,500 by 1,200 pixels. Um, and it's 10 megabits per second. <laughs> like, if you just put this, like, really fast Wi-Fi and you just hit the URL, it stalls in your browser. Like, just trying to watch the video, forget everything else. Like, it's a mess. Um, best practice, resize your videos to something reasonable. Because this is served on mobile as well. Of course. Um, pro tip, changing the file name to 720p <laughs> doesn't actually <laughs> change the resolution or the bit rate of your video. It's new. <laughs> so I took the video and I resized it to a bunch of sizes that are normal, right? 8, 4, 3, 1. Like, even the 8, that's not outrageously bad. I mean, it's not great, but, you know... Maybe the eight megabyte for desktop and one of these threes or ones or whatever for, for everyone else. Um, yeah, so you know it's downloading, it does it on mobile, but it times out because eventually after 17 megabytes it just stops and then you don't ever see it. Um, yeah, so now we can watch the video because that's half the fun. She's super excited, she sees her granddaughter or whatever is super happy. And then it starts over again. So they loop it twice. You download it twice. You download the loop twice, and then it loops inside the code. Um, don't duplicate it in the video. That's what the loop thing in your, in your HTML was for. Now, I think when I did this compression here, I think it just realized that like the second half was identical to the first half and that's why it compressed so much better. Like I actually used compression to make it smaller. Um, but I call this look 
And this is another background video that 30 megabytes, 42 seconds. I call this the mobile middle finger. <laughs> because if you're downloading video like that to your mobile users, you're just kind of saying, I don't really care about your data plan or how much battery you have in your phone. Um, so the best practice so far, if you've got a retina device, see if you really need to serve a retina video to the users. If the video is going to be hidden, don't download it. Maybe resize it. Avoid preload equals auto. Preload equals metadata. Strip out the audio track if it's silent. Don't duplicate the video. And you know it all just comes down to respect your mobile users' data plans. And your own. And your own. And your own on your back end, right? You're paying money for all of these videos to be sent down. Um, but let's talk a little bit about video streaming as well. It's not as much, but there is video streaming. And these are just. The HTTP archive is just looking at landing pages, so it's just the home page of all these sites. It's not going into third or fourth layers or anything that's really video, where most video is. But when you're streaming, this is HLS video, which is what most streaming video is today. The first thing you get is a manifest file, and it lists all the different streams. So when you're streaming video, you've got like a low quality one and a high quality one and ones in between. And the player can pick the one that's appropriate for both the screen size and also for uh, the network speed. The player picks a stream, starts downloading the segments, and ideally what will happen is you'll get a buffer and you will play back and it'll look great. And it will play. That's what we want to see happen. When the video starts playing, the, play, the, the, the player now can estimate the throughput and it can change the video. So if it's downloading a really low quality video, maybe it'll download something higher quality so that it looks better. And then you get the optimal bit rate. And then, of course, if you go into a tunnel or in, in further away from the windows in your building or whatever, it will change the bit rate. Um, um, is there the possibility to suggest, OK, try first the high bit rate and then the strategy to download? I'm going to talk about that in just a second. Okay. In the HTTP archive, the mobile tests are run at 3G 1.6. Desktop is run at five. So we're going to see some different numbers when I talk mobile desktop just because of the way the tests are run. This is what a manifest file looks like. This is from a TED talk. Um, the first bit, these are all the video tracks. Those are iframe video tracks in case they're in an iframe. And then these are the audio tracks and the subtitles. And this one is really neat because the guy's talking in Japanese, but the first choice is like Greek for the subtitles. It's really interesting because like, the way the player decides which the order of the subtitles is it just goes through the list, right? So if the first one is Greek, that's going to be the first one that it shows. It's really interesting that perhaps they thought Greek was the most popular language that people would see <laughs> for this video. Um, it's sort of like when you try to check in for your flight and at least for me, sometimes the United States is at the top, but sometimes it's under you. And if you're Ryanair, it's under A for America, which makes no sense at all. Um, but let's look at the video tracks. Um, they kind of look like this. What you see here is each row lists the resolution, if they're subtitles, and then it lists the URL to start downloading the file. Right. So it has all this information. And what the player does, well, actually, we see that 1,900 of these files are identical. And so what that means to me is the first, uh, the first stream that's selected will be the same for mobile and for desktop. Because what the player does is it always just picks the first one on the list. It has to pick something. It has to start somewhere. So it always just picks the first one on the list. So if you're serving the same manifest to desktop and to mobile, you're going to start with this first one, 640 by 360. Bandwidth 1.42 megabits per second. You can see it there on the on the left in green. Um, so this is the initial bit rates, right? There are a lot that are you know sort of in the 500, 600,000 kilobit per second. There's a whole bunch up here at three megabit per second. While these tests are being run on mobile at 1.6, we know that that video isn't going to play. So that startup isn't where you want it to be if you want your video to work on mobile. Or you want it to start up quickly on mobile. We'll see what happens when you start too high. Um, so if we look at the initial is green, 
mobile actually speeds up a little bit over here. You can see that there's a lot here and it's maybe lower and then, you know, you can see that the, the yellow is where they end up being for the most part, mostly between 200 and 300,000 kilobits per second. Desktop is, you know, it's spread out a little bit more because it's a faster network connection, right? We get a lot more in the 1.4, 1.5 megabits per second in the purple. Um, so what happens if the player selects a high bitrate stream at the, at the initial outcome? It starts downloading the video segments, but the buffer starts taking a long time to fill. And the player has an algorithm that's, that they, it knows the longer it takes for the video to start up, the more likely they're going to go away. So when the video doesn't play, the player stops, picks a lower bit rate, and starts playing. The buffer starts filling up, and the video plays. So what does that So when that happens, you've just added an extra couple of steps, right? So now you've got people abandoning, because you've added a couple seconds, a couple extra steps. Um, let's walk to see what happens here. So if you start, what happens if you start at the lowest bit rate? Right? It's going to look crappy at the very beginning. And then you know, the, the player will eventually speed up and find something in the middle and it'll look sharp. You guys have all seen this. You start watching a video, the first three seconds are all pixely and grainy, and then four seconds in, it snaps into something looking really good. People do that so that it starts out really, really fast with a low quality bit rate, knowing that the first three or four seconds of a video is usually, you know, 20th Century Fox, or it's the beginning of a movie, or it's black as they zoom into like a news story or something. The first five seconds usually don't matter. So they know that by the time you get to content you care about, it will look good. This is the fastest way to get the video to start. What happens if you start high? It starts downloading it. It doesn't work. The player goes down to the lowest bit rate. Looks exactly the same as it did over there. And then eventually sharpens up. But we added a step, which could be two, three, four, five, six seconds, adding delay to the startup of the video. This is what Amazon does. They use the, I call it the Goldilocks approach because they're not too small, not too big. They pick the one right in the middle. And the reason they do that is remember people who are watching a longer movie hang out a little bit longer. You're watching an Amazon TV show, it's at least 20 minutes long. You're going to hang out a couple extra seconds. It's going to look great from the very beginning. It won't have that pixely at the beginning. It'll be sharp right at the beginning. So some developers have chosen this approach because if it's a longer play video, people will hang out and watch. We can graph it. This is web page test. When you start low, in this case, it started playing in 11 seconds. When I started with the highest bit rate, it was 17 seconds. But this quality is exactly the same as that quality over there. It added an extra five seconds of time for that video to play. And then the middle ground, this video is much sharper than either of those, but it started right in the middle. So if we start looking at the pros and cons of all of this, when you start low, or when you start at the high bit rate, it's going to look great if you're on fiber or you know a really, really fast connection. But for just about everyone else, the initial quality is going to be low, and it's going to be a slow startup. I tried this. I had like Wi-Fi that was like 50 megabit per second, and it still cut down on the eight megabit per. You know, the eight. This is the startup here is eight and a half megabits per second, and the player still gave up. It's like that's too big. I'm moving on. So it just it won't do it on mobile. Um, low to low to high, right? If you start low. Uh, fast startup, the initial quality is low, but it picks up, it catches up pretty quickly. And then, of course, here in the middle ground, the initial quality is good, but it takes a little longer to start up. It's sort of in the middle ground again. So this is what it looks like when I download a TED Talk um, using web page test. And TED Talks are really neat. They strip out the audio into a different download. And why that's really cool is if you have a dubbed channel for a different movie, you can just switch it to DE or to ES, and then you have it playing in that language, right? So um, that's kind of a really cool thing. But the, uh, <clears throat> the teal is the video files being downloaded. This is the bandwidth for the different TED Talks. So it starts at 1.4 megabits per second, and then you can see all the other bit rates that are available. Um, I believe this one, I think that's audio. 
Um, so testing with web page tests on 3G, um, it immediately drops down to this 64 kilobits per second. Mm -hmm. And it never recovers. It's really cool. They have a parameter that plays a preview. It's the TED Talk sound with the stars and the, you, you've all heard it. Like I was testing this over and over again. My kids are like, why are you watching so many TED Talks, Dad? <laughs> um, and then this is the actual talk. It's being served at this really low quality, crappy video. And I was like, well, why isn't it recovering? I'm doing this on 3G, you know, 1.6 megabits per second, which is here. There are a whole bunch of other bit rates that would probably work. Why isn't the player finding the right bit rate? So it starts off at 1.4 megabits per second. But if we look at the name of the file, the file is actually 600 kilobits per second video. That's what the 600K means. So they've overstated the bandwidth there, which is caught, they're being super conservative, but it's actually breaking the delivery of the content. What if I change the bandwidth to match by the, the names of the files, right? So 600, 600, this one is 64K, 64K, right? All the way down. My graph looks different. It used to look like that, but the Y axis is gonna change, right? Now I'm at a different Y axis. And when I test it, it initially drops down to that low bit rate, but then eventually comes back up to that higher bit rate. And I thought, well, that's still wrong. Something's still not right here because 600K should stream just fine when I've got 1.6 megabits per second. So I went further in and I looked at the manifest file and what's, what, it, what the manifest file here is it's saying, this segment is five seconds long and then they've got a byte range of like 900,000. Right. This one is seven seconds long, and they have a byte range of like, what's that, like 50,000 bytes? Like, they've totally munged the math. There's something wrong with the math there. And I tried to figure out all the math. I couldn't get it to work right, so I just said, screw it. I'm just going to download one, and I added it all up. It's an 11 seconds in the beginning, right? So now it's just downloading the preview. It's 11.9 <coughs> seconds, and when... I do all those optimizations, it doesn't drop to the lower bit rate. It stays looking good all the way through. Well, this is what they should be doing, right? And then eventually, because I've optimized it, it actually goes up to 950. So I'm getting a better quality video than I was getting before. I haven't changed anything else but just the parameters in the manifest file. They were being so conservative with the values in the manifest file, it was breaking the streaming quality on mobile devices. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the Spengler, and I don't have the audio on here, but there's a video here it's from Ghostbusters, and uh, let's see, let me see if I can get the video to, you know, probably won't even hear it, but let's, let's try. I'll turn up my volume on my, I was in the airport, so I didn't want it to be blasting when I was, and maybe it'll go out through, through here, let's see what happens. You guys all know the movie? Yeah. You know, okay, okay, great. Yeah, I, I figured as much, but... <laughs> all right, it's not going to say... But you know what he's saying here? Anybody? He's warning everybody. This is the first time they've ever fired these things, right? Don't cross the streams. Whatever <laughs> you do, don't cross the streams. And why do you not want to cross the streams? Well, this is a, a, a website that has two TED Talks that they're downloading simultaneously. And so there's this one and then there's that one. And what ends up happening is the way the streaming player works, it's trying to maximize based on the available throughput. But if you have two things downloading, they both end up at a lower bit rate. If you just had one, it'd be downloading up here at 950, right? Or even higher. I did this on desktop. But what they were doing is by downloading two streams at once, and I've seen three streams at once, right? If you're downloading all this stuff, you're preloading these videos, right? Preload equals auto, no one's gonna do it anyway. And you're doing it at super low quality. So you're kind of hurting your, hurting your customers, you're not giving the right, you know, exactly what they wanna see. 
So don't cross the streams, as they said in Ghostbusters. Uh, when you stream two videos at once, you're lowering the quality of both. Um, the other interesting thing about this is, um, I don't have this in the talk, but if you go to TED, you know, TED.com and you pick a video and it says, you know, put, embed this on your web page, it's got one line of code, and you just put it on the web page, um, it'll download the whole video when you put that on your web page. I don't know if that's like how they have such great page views for their videos, is because you embed it on the web page and just downloads it every single time. Um, but take that into account. If you embed a Facebook widget on your page in Chrome, if there's a video on that timeline or whatever that you embed in your page, on Chrome it'll download 30% of that video. So imagine you have to scroll down six pages to find the Facebook widget and they have to scroll through the Facebook widget to find that video. It's already downloaded. Right, so you know, just be careful with the third parties that when you have video from other companies that it's, um, YouTube and Vimeo don't download any video, they wait for you to press play. So that's, they download like 600K of JavaScript, but you know, <laughs> you gotta play your trade-offs, right? Um, in summary, I appreciate you all listening. Video files are really, really big. Um, respect your customer's data plans, resize it, quality, bit rate, dimensions. Um, don't download hidden video, don't use preload auto, strip out the audio track for silent stuff, don't duplicate the traffic. Um, start at a slower, lower bit rate for faster startup. Um, start at the middle bit rate for better startup quality. Um, even after bit rate changes to prevent stalls, and use the correct bit rates to optimize the delivery so you get good quality. Um, and then, of course, don't cross the streams, one video at a time for best quality. And so with that, thank you very much, everybody, for listening. <laughs>
More questions? Yes, please. Right. So you can't do media queries in the video tag, unfortunately. So like in the picture tag, you can say for this width, give me this image, this. You can't do that with video. So you have to write a little JavaScript to, to serve the right video or hide it if you want to hide it. Um, kind of all fits together in one little script, right? If you wanted to do that. Yeah. That's a good question. I, th I, I wouldn't say incompetence, but I would just say that, uh, you know, a lot of times, how does the video, how does the image get there? Someone says, here, put this image up on the website and it's not optimized, right? Someone gives you a video, you have to know, you have to have knowledge to create a stream for it. So you have to know what tools to use and how to do it. If you want to call that incompetence or just like they've got a lot of shit to do and that's not high on the list of things to figure out. Um, just doing a video is, it's easier, right? You just video equals source and, it, and you're done. One more question up here. What video player do you recommend? What do I? Which video player so in these tests, that, that's a good question. So I haven't done a full analysis of all the JavaScript video players that are out there for browsers. It's on my list of things to do. Okay. Um, all of my tests, I've been, you know, when I run like all these uh, TED Talks, I was using hls.js, but there are a couple other ones out there as well. I guess I've seen uh, Chrome DevTools a lot of times in your slides. Yes. Um, is this a reliable way of testing mobile connections? Uh, if you just set the to mobile limit speed to simulate mobile device? It seems to work really well. Um, there's a bug in Chrome right now that it doesn't measure the video kilobytes very well. It's fixed in Canary. So if you use it in Canary, it works just fine. Um, I use it as a good proxy, you know, when I'm doing a lot of my just like Let's see if this works, and then I'll put it to web page test because they have a lot of actual real devices that I can test on. Um, just because I don't have a whole library of devices that I at my fingertips to test with. Do you know any any um, software you would recommend to to, uh, to analyze on actual mobile device, like an Android for example? For native or web. Native. Native, so I worked on a tool when I was at AT&T that's really good for that. It's called Video Optimizer, and it runs network traces on your device. And so you can actually, it's like running Wireshark on your device, and you get all that. Um, and you can see all the packet captures, and then it does an analysis for a, a lot of the stuff you see in web page tests. If you're interested, I can we can talk later. OK, last question, maybe. Yes, please. Um, have you experience with PWA and Medium? Say. Um, do you have experience with PWA? Progressive web apps. Yeah. Have, haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> haven't gotten there yet. So, um, so are you talking about like the caching of the videos? It's a good question. There's a, there's a blog post by Andy Davies about a couple of weeks ago about shared caching across things. About how, Facebook has a couple of studies on how long stuff stays in your cache. I guess with the service worker, videos might stay a little bit longer, um, but I haven't tested it, no. All right. Maybe one question from the dark side over there. <laughs> you don't hear much of you. It's the dark side. They ask when they want. <laughs> oh, now, now this is also no, dark. No, that's also dark. I didn't do that. OK, well, no, I actually also have one question. All right, yeah. How about the YouTube? Can I just use YouTube and say problem fixed? So when you do a YouTube video, if you just embed the YouTube video on yep. your web page, it doesn't download any of the video right away. They do a lot of the optimizations, right? They're, they're YouTube, right? They're on the forefront of optimizing video. That's what they do for their job. Um, you have other problems because people can flag your video, right? Because it's public on YouTube, so your video could disappear. Um, you don't own where it is. 
right? So that's one of the issues that people have with YouTube is if it's something, even if you have it as a private video, people can figure out the URL. And so yes, you can. It solves a lot of the problems. The on the converse, of course, is you've got 600 kilobytes of JavaScript that are downloaded to embed that on your page. Sure. So just like I'm complaining about the videos downloading megabytes and or 500K, every time you do that, YouTube is downloading all of their wrappers.js and stuff. <laughs> cool. All right, then. Thank you, Doug. Thank you. That was a great talk.